Difficulties doing this subtest. They have difficulties trying to put these things in the right order and trying to understand cause and effect in a social arrangement. After evaluating hundreds of criminals, Dr. Nestor makes a critical observation. The psychotic person's beliefs are intense. The vast majority of people who have mental illness are not violent. The violent psychotic killer is rare. But there's a very small group of people who have mental illness and who have very rare symptoms of that mental illness that probably results in their elevated rates of violence. And it's a very small group Mental illness, on its own, is not likely to lead to violence. But like brain damage, it's one vulnerability that, in some cases, can impair judgment. They don't necessarily have a clear mental diagnosis, but they have symptoms such as paranoia, which makes them misunderstand social situations. And sometimes the violent behavior has been in response to a misperception of a social situation. Brain damage and mental illness are significant, but it's the third factor in Dr. Pincus's recipe that ultimately fuels a killer's rage. I had a screwed up childhood, no doubt in my mind about that. Is there a formula for violence? A recipe to create a serial killer? Dr. Jonathan Pincus believes he knows the ingredients. Brain damage and mental illness impair judgment, but it's the third factor that fuels the rage, childhood abuse. The person who is abused wants to be violent. The mental illness and the neurologic damage make it difficult or impossible for him to prevent himself from becoming violent. I had a screwed up childhood, no doubt in my mind about that. Tommy Lynn Sells says he was sexually abused as a child by a neighbor. He killed as many as 70 victims across the country, typically by breaking into their homes and stabbing them. He admits his first victim may have been connected to his own experiences as a child. I went up there to look and see what was going on, and I seen this man performing all sex on a little boy. Uh -huh. and, and I said, oh no, that, that dude's dying. Eileen Warnos was raised by her grandparents. She claimed they physically and sexually abused her. She eventually shot eight men. Andrei Chikatilo terrorized Russia from 1978 to 1990. He lured children from train stations to the nearby woods. There, he removed their eyes, cut out their organs, and ate their flesh. Chikatilo's own childhood may have influenced his crimes. He was born during a severe famine. Rumors of cannibalism spread. Chikatilo's mother told him that his brother was kidnapped, then eaten. She warned him that if he wasn't careful, the same thing would happen to him. These killers show the link between violent childhoods and vicious crimes. A connection now being probed by scientists like Dr. Pincus. When he was really mad at something he may have done, did he ever go beyond where he thought or you thought he perhaps should have? Did it ever break your skin? Were you knocked out? One research tool provides the most thorough analysis, the face-to-face -face interview. Well, what was the worst punishment that, that you ever had? What kind of thing did you do that would evoke being hit with a belt? There are ways of examining a brain. And the most powerful is for me to sit down and talk to the person and get his history. That picks up a tremendous amount of pathology. Pathology that is not available to any other technique. A technique used by another researcher. Dr. Michael Stone is a forensic psychiatrist with Columbia University. He interviews criminals about their childhoods to gauge any aftermath of abuse. He is at a maximum security prison in New York to interview the notorious serial killer, Arthur Shawcross. This is Shawcross's second time in prison. He killed two children in 1972 and served 14 years. A 
year after his release, in 1987, he went on a killing rampage, strangling 11 prostitutes and then eating some of their remains. Did Shawcross's childhood provide clues to his future crimes? As a child, Arthur Shawcross was a loner, cut off from others at home and at school, yet at times filled with uncontrollable rage. Shawcross appears to have two ingredients of Dr. Pincus's theory, brain damage and mental illness. Dr. Stone interviews Shawcross to probe for the third factor, childhood abuse. I'd like to ask whether you remember a time in your life when things were okay, you know, before they got bad, age three, age four, age five. Was there ever a good time in your life or was it bad from the get-go? I can remember back to when I was about four. When I was four, something happened to me with my mother. Uh -huh. And that's when I was introduced to sex, uh -huh. oral sex. And have four, just playing, right? And then when I was about seven, she did it again. Uh, and then again, it happened when I was about nine. Yeah. Shawcross reveals that the sexual abuse turns violent. And when I started uh, doing the same thing with my younger sister, well, I told my mother, I said, I love my sister Jeannie more than sister and brother. Right? And, yeah. And she tried to convince me, no, it's not going to happen. You know, that's not right. Yeah, that's when she take a butcher knife to you and grab a hold of it. And she says, if you don't behave yourself, I'll cut it off. Were you aware that this is something that not any mom does? I didn't even think about it. I was uh, too scared. Dr. Stone suspects that the sexual abuse, together with physical threats, created anger in a young Shawcross. I used to get angry at the drop of the hat. Without a clue as to what was getting you angry? Or did no. you have some clues? No. Shawcross would grow up to strangle and mutilate 11 prostitutes. You ever had thoughts that had to do with your mom? You know, where you really felt like dicing her, you know, or, or making pot roast out of her? I don't want to answer that. Because it would be understandable, wouldn't it? It would be understandable. Sure it would. I mean, all yeah. she, what, what you thoughts were, that thought, those thoughts were there. Yeah. You know, I wanted to hurt her in a worse way. Yeah. Arthur Shawcross is now serving a 250-year sentence. His story supports Dr. Pincus's recipe that childhood abuse generates anger that can express itself later in life and in the case of Arthur Shawcross, in brutal ways. If the person has been abused and beaten every day of his life and has that legitimate fear for life in the home of his parents, he's living with the people who are supposed to be protecting him and he has a legitimate fear of whether he's going to be killed or not every day or dismembered or burned or tortured. And these are realities of his life. When that person is immature and can't control his impulses, you have a very, very dangerous individual. The crimes of many killers can be traced back to experiences of abuse and neglect. Charles Manson was born to a teenage prostitute and given the name No Name Maddox. He was later sold by his mother for a bottle of beer. He eventually led a cult which slaughtered five victims. Edmund Kemper endured years of belittling from a cruel mother. He eventually killed eight victims before decapitating his mother, removing her larynx, and shoving it down the disposal. According to Dr. Pincus, brain damage and mental illness are the gunpowder, and childhood abuse lights the fuse. And if a person has all three of these ingredients to this deadly recipe, the results can be devastating. But can Dr. Pincus's formula explain one of the most bizarre and vicious torture killers? Get him. You got, you got the, what's his name coming? I think I know how to make a serial murder. You take a person who has a basic mental illness and you torture that person continuously and beat them. If you do that, you will have 
someone who wants to get even, who feels that he has been victimized and wants to be empowered. And if there's neurologic damage on top of all of that, then we have a very, very dangerous individual. You'll have a, uh, a serial murder with that. You got the, what's his name coming? Gary Heidnick is one of the most sadistic torture killers of our time. Can Dr. Pincus's recipe shed light on his vicious crimes? 1987, Gary Heidnick keeps six women chained in the basement of his Philadelphia home. For months, he rapes them daily. He mutilates their eardrums so they can't hear him and blares the radio to mask their cries for help. He wants them to bear his children, and when they fail to get pregnant, his cruelty escalates. One victim dies of starvation. Heidnick puts her remains in a blender, mixes them with cans of dog food, then forces the other women to eat it. Heidnick experiments with a new torture, shocking his captives with jolts of electricity. A second captive dies of electrocution. It is precisely from Dr. Pincus's cauldron of factors from which Gary Heidnick emerged. The first factor, brain damage. Heidnick fell from a tree at age six and sustained neurological damage. Mental illness is another category. Almost everyone I've seen has been mentally ill. The second factor, mental illness. Heidnick had a history of schizophrenia, paranoia, and delusions. His home was bizarre. Dollar bills and pennies lined the walls. Yet Heidnick was a near genius and a shrewd investor, amassing a half million dollar fortune. The third and final factor, abuse. Heidnick claimed to be a victim. During his childhood in Cleveland, his father allegedly disciplined him by hanging him by his feet out a third-story window. A lot of people are paranoid and misinterpret things. And if they have been suppressing violent impulses all their lives, when this kind of thing develops, they can't. And they do uh, bad stuff. In 1987, police discovered the women held captive in Gary Heidnick's basement. He said the women were there when he moved in. Gary Heidnick was executed in 1999. No one claimed his remains. The combination of three factors does provide a potent recipe for some violent criminals. But some serial killers appear to be exceptions. Serial killers like Ted Bundy. There was no reported history of mental illness, no clinical diagnosis of brain damage. He had an unusual childhood, but he was not known to be abused. At his trial, his mother described their close relationship. Ted being the oldest, and uh, you might say my pride and joy, our relationship was always very special. In the 1970s, Ted Bundy strangled, beat, and stabbed at least 30 women in Washington, Utah, Colorado, and Florida. For the killers like Bundy, who don't appear to have the three factors Dr. Pincus describes, another area of science offers a potential explanation for their criminal tendencies. And if these researchers are correct, there could be millions of people who behave like Ted Bundy. I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. What is the makeup of a murderer? Is there a formula for those considered most evil? One potent recipe links mental illness, brain damage, and childhood abuse. But there are killers who bear no clear mark of these vulnerabilities. Serial killers like Ted Bundy. 